what I want to do now is to talk about the basics of fire. So this unfortunately is the part where I have to talk. Um, and I'm going to explain at a high level, again, kind of at a, at a clinician level, what fire actually is. And as I've said before, please don't, don't, don't hesitate to sing out if you're not sure about something. So this, this here, this is the, um, the elevator speech for fire. So this is where you've, you've stepped into an elevator and a, a person standing next to you says, Oh, I know who you are. I've heard about fire. What is fire? Here is how you answer them. You say, that fire is an H or 7 interoperability standard and then you then explain that interoperability means sharing information. You say that there's two main parts to fire. The first main part is there is a content model. There's, there's ways of representing the information. The second thing is there's an exchange specification. How do you actually share it? Because there's more than one way that you can do so. You would admit that fire, although it started as being a simple interoperability uh, mechanism, has since grown kind of out of control, rather like a, a well no, I won't go into any, any analogy is going to get me into trouble, so I'll just avoid them completely. <laughs> but we're getting a lot more into what we call clinical knowledge. So we're getting into things like decision support, we're getting into quality metrics. Um, it's also being used as persistence. Again, in the early days, we were quite clear that fire is not a persistence mechanism, a storage mechanism, and it remains not, but some people are doing it. Uh, and finally, the last thing you would say as the doors are about to open is that it's supported by a huge community worldwide. <coughs> so that is the elevator speech for fire. Any questions? Yo. Why was it not to be persisted and why are some people persisting it? Because what we wanted to focus on is in the interoperability space. We didn't want to make it that you had to represent your data in a particular format in order to be able to share it. H or 7 has never been in that space. You think of V2, V2, CDA, whatever. They don't dictate what the storage thing they say. Just say, look, store it however you want, but if you want to share it, use this. What's happened? As, as fire is evolving, as the resources are maturing, as people are starting to use it, they're sort of saying, well, hold on a second, I've got pretty much everything I need anyway, I'll just store it as a resource. So again, horses for courses. Some are doing it, some are not. There's a whole lot of, you can actually download for free a fully featured fire server. And we were talking earlier on about that, so I have one running on my machine, so if the interweb goes down, I can flip across to a local machine and I'm, I'm good to go. So that's why people are doing it. And, and there are some organisations storing in, in the UK, so, storing in fire persistence. Yeah, I've come across an exactly. American so, company who yeah. are claiming to do that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's pros and cons as always. Perhaps in a slightly, little bit more detail, I'll go through some of the key parts. So it actually stands for something, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. The fast being that it's intended to be fast to be able to design stuff and to deploy stuff. Healthcare, because that's all it, all it did, um, all it does. Healthcare, and healthcare includes veterinary science, by the way. People have, can and have used it for other things, but that's beyond our remit. Interoperability, as I've said, was the, where it started from. And resources are a key part of FIRE. We'll look at those in a bit more detail right now. In fact, we'll look at them right down there. So the second thing is these consistent, simple-to-use content models. We're going to look at them in just a second, but with controlled extensibility. This is a key part. So we had back in the days a, a what we call the rule of 80%. And the rule of 80% was that a data element made its way into the core resource if it was already being used by 80% of systems. Already being used. We were focusing and are focusing on real world interoperability, not what we believe should happen. For the latter, there are extensions. Extensions are a first class member of FHIR. Our expectation is that any real usage of FHIR will use extensions. It's normal. You can think of extensions as being Z segments done right. And I'll explain a little bit more about, about why I say that later on. And that's the controlled extensibility. It supports all paradigms of exchange. We think of four different paradigms. That comes back to a little bit of the topic you are talking about before. So we talk about um, documents, discharge summaries that we're talking about today. 
We talk about, and a document is something which is a uh, summary at a point in time, it's part of the clinical record, you keep it forever. We talk about messages, think V2, where a message is an instruction from one system to another system which gets discarded um, after that. Um, we have operations, uh, and we have the RESTful interface. So the RESTful interface is the real-time interface. This is where Fire actually started from in the first place. That's the ability to make a real-time query of a system. Um, what are the patient's medications? Get a list back. Um, I want to update their medication list. Update the list. Real-time interoperability. So four different paradigms. Fire supports them all. Design with implementers in mind. Really, really important. This is actually the way V2 worked um, and the way V3 didn't. So V2, for those who have been around since 87, was a couple of guys in Duke University saying, you know, we should be able to exchange information a little bit better than this, and built something up from there. Um, V3 came along and the modelers said, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. You should have this great big model in the sky and everything be perfect. Um, so FHIR has come very much back to that practical implementer way of doing things. It's open source, it's freely available. The specification is online, I'll show it to you in a second if you haven't seen it. It's fully hyperlinked, and you might think in this day and age that, I mean, so what? But in the healthcare space, having a specification that's immediately available and immediately navigable is huge. You know, if you've ever tried to work your way through the V2 spec or the CDA spec or, or DICOM or IHE, you'll appreciate that, you know, having it available is, is really something useful. Freely available tooling. Servers and libraries, again, ClinFire is just one of those things. There are libraries, the Happy Library for Java, the um, Vonk Library, uh, which is um, uh, Dutch for Fire, uh, for C Sharp. There are libraries for, um, uh, for the Android, for uh, Apple, and so on and so forth. They're free, open source, available to anybody. And there are servers available. So they're not fully production grade servers, but it wouldn't take too much to make them so. But you can download in the space of literally about five minutes, a fully fledged fire server, I've got one on my machine here, and just do stuff with it. Uh, strong endorsement from vendors and regulatory uh, um, community, so I call it interopen uh, into here, but in the US we've got Argonaut, pretty much around the world everyone's doing something in fire, and there's a massive supporting community. Um, there, is, there are chat resources, it's, it is very common to ask a question online and get an answer in the space of minutes. Back in the day we used to prove it, but people got bored with doing that, so I don't anymore. David, just I'm to sorry. make things real for the UK, so on the paradigms of exchange, the document, the dish transfer of care documents, but on the real-time interface, who's heard of GP Connect? You know, get me the GP medication, that, that could be that restful interface to get that real-time, and in terms of that... Um, you talked about the specifications being online. When we've done curation, where we've tried to take an information model for PRSB and map it to a fire resource in the STU3 standard, which we'll, we'll come to, we've used those online specifications and actually in real time looked at what the specs say online, mapped it to our models to come up with answers of proposals of what we're going to use in the UK. So th th we yet, I'm, I'm we've used all that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so just with that paradigms of exchange here, again, I just want to point out, so I don't go into this in detail in this, in this particular audience, but each para the paradigms, they all use the same underlying artifacts. So for example, you could have a fire-based system which had laboratory messages coming up with fire observations and diagnostic reports, store them in a fire repository. You could have restful type interactions, maybe a nurse on the ward taking observations or a patient updating their own results or a um, a clinician um, uh, creating orders, and then you could summarize those all into a document which would be part of the discharge summary. Now, using existing standards, that top one, the message would be V2, the, um, the document would be a CDA, and the bottom one would be something non-standard because we haven't got one. With FHIR, they are all the same <laughs> resources, and I'll show you how that works. Where do you use FHIR? There are a number of places. These are three common ones. So this one here is probably the more common one at the moment, and that is where you already have a database of information, coming back to the point that we were talking about before. So think about Orion Health. So we already have a database where we have lots of clinical information, as does InterSystems, as does Epic, as does Cerner. Uh, and so what we do is we create a library on the top of that, and we expose fire out that other side. So from the perspective of a consumer coming down through here, they just see fire. They don't have any knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes. So 
that's probably the more common one as people are becoming used to fire. Over here is the other model we talked about, where we actually take fire resources there and we persist them in the personal health record or in some other kind of database. Again, from the consumer's perspective out here, it's fire. And then the third one is the integration engine one, and this is really where, as we move forwards and as fire become, begins to become uh, used out there, we're going to have a big need for migrating between the different representations of information, between V3 and V2 on the one hand and fire on the other, because this is not going to be a rip and replace. That's never going to work. Fire will come in incrementally over time, and so therefore there needs to be a way for the different uh, standards to actually coexist. So they are just three different architectures. And we think of fire as being what we call a platform specification. We don't dictate what the architecture is. That is up to you. It could be a pull type architecture where you request information and get it back. It could be a push type architecture where you push data onto a server. You could use a messaging paradigm where you, where you send a message off and it eventually arrives there. You could have a subscription mechanism where you ask to be notified of changes. The possibilities are endless. Fire doesn't dictate those architectures. There's already ways of doing that. Um, this is just some sample clinical use cases I thought might be kind of interesting to, to think about where fire uh, can and actually is being used. So the first one is this direct exchange of structured and coded information. That's really what we're talking about today with the, uh, with the discharge summary. Then there's the real-time access to data, uh, mobile applications. Really this is where fire got its, got its leg up, is, uh, is in providing this kind of access. Referrals is another big one. And when you think about referrals, the job is a heck of a lot harder than just creating a referral document. There's all this underlying directory infrastructure you need to think about. You know, where are the services? Who's providing the services? What about scheduling? And so on and so forth. So all of those things um, are allowed for by resources inside of fire. Storage of clinical data, we've touched on a couple of times. Um, and as I've said, the other common pattern is the interface pattern between the two. And the clinical decision support, there's a big move to uh, actually start representing decision support artifacts and fire artifacts. If you look at the specification, uh, which I think I'm coming to in a second, you'll see that there's a whole section now on clinical knowledge. And that's on both coding what that clinical knowledge is, so you know, what are the rules around um, opium, I'm sorry, opioid overdose is a big thing in the US. So what they're starting to do is they're starting to do management protocols and code those management protocols using fire resources so that they can be shared amongst providers. So knowledge sharing. Uh, and there's this really cool standard called CDS Hooks, which is providing a standardized way of an EHR system being able to access these decision support mechanisms. So those are just some of the kind of clinical type scenarios that fire is being used for. Yep. Uh, so with referrals, is the e-referral service going to be using FHIR as its native language and architecture? I can't speak to a specific implement. All I, all I, all I meant, so, yeah, I'll give you in a second. All I meant by that was to say that the, what we're doing inside of the FHIR project is to provide the resources that could be used for such a purpose. So this, this isn't about NHS digital strategy today. However... <laughs> So just, this is about just fire. Uh, the intention is for all these developments to go down and use fire as and when they're on their development program. So yes, they are looking at all those aspects. And the Care Connect profiles that are being developed through Interopen would be distributed through those different projects as they go on their roadmaps. This is, um, this just, this is a slide that um, serves a couple of purposes. The first is it puts fire in context with some of the other uh, HL7 standards. There are, of course, other healthcare interoperability standards, but fire, uh, HL7 is the one we're talking about. So V2 has been around for since 87, very much the messaging paradigm. Was that a question? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Hey, go back. So, uh, can I just go back a step as a, a slow thinking surgeon? Uh, to your last slide of, of examples of when you might use fire. For somebody like me, where every, you, and lots of people using it as a buzz, buzzword, some, some guidance is when you might not use fire when, and people might not avoid, avoid temptation and risks. And that, that's, that wouldn't be helpful as well, because a lot of people are saying fire will solve the world and cause world, promote world peace and things. 
and I suspect for you the, some of the applications being suggested are probably inappropriate, and that would be helpful to me at least. Okay. Well, um, I think world hunger, yes. World peace, hard. <laughs> Slight, actually, that is a, it's a really good question. And it's a really good question because what, what you're saying is that fire will solve these problems. Fire will not. That's, and that's really, really important. And one of the things we're coming across a bit now, so that we've kicked the door open and people are falling through, fire is not the answer to everything. Healthcare is a complicated, complicated domain. Fire solves some of the issues so that you can focus on the other more, more complicated ones. But of, in and of itself, it's not a solution. This is part to it. In terms of where you wouldn't put it, um, I'm sure there are places, um, off the top of my head I haven't come across one, but then I'm a total fanatic, so I'm not the best person to ask. Um, and for, because what we're finding is that it's starting to percolate out into areas that you wouldn't have thought of, like, like the clinical knowledge. We never ever thought at the beginning that someone will create a fire resource to store clinical knowledge. Genomics, they're all being done in fire now. Some of the detailed stuff, like, um, like some of the, the, the actual sequencing, deep sequencing, you might not want to put in fire, although there was a sequence resource that summarises them. So it's difficult, and I'd, I'd prefer to think about use cases. Come up with a use case, and I'll tell you whether or not we can meet it. How, how's that? And, and I did surgery too, by the way, so, uh, but it was a long time ago. David, um, you've got all four of those those um, arrows going going into into the future, 2020, um, and certainly in the UK, there's discussion about depreciating CDA in favour of fire. Do you see some of those petering out? Otherwise, we're ending up with four parallel standards. Checks in the mail. Um, so the other the other thing I was going to talk about is exactly that question. So, from the perspective of capability, fire has got the potential to replace all of those. Now I'm going to preface that by being just a little wee bit careful and saying and just reminding us that fire is actually not yet fully baked. We're still being developed. It's still in a in a we hesitate to use the word draft, but, but it is a draft stand. It's getting pretty solid now. We actually have a, con, a concept called maturity models, where individual resources have got a particular maturity. Uh, and as they, as they get more mature, and part of that maturity is testing in real life scenarios, they become less and less able to be changed. The um, ba ballot that we're doing at the end of next year will have the first normative uh, resources, which can't then be changed. But right here, right now, we're still in a position where we can react to changes which I think is a good thing, because it means we can use it, and we can see what works and what doesn't, and change it accordingly. To come back to your question, um, I think what we're going to find is that uh, fire, in, in terms of, it's almost going to go up this other way. I think we'll find that, that, that fire, well, let me turn it around the other way. If you're going to replace it, you've got to have a business reason to do so. So if you think of version two, version two is out there in enormous use, it, it, it basically meeting the needs, you've got to ask the question, why would you bother to replace it? If, if something comes up, if it's a new requirement, yes, use fire, but you wouldn't want to put millions of dollars into something without getting a business benefit. Short, short answer is, I think V2, we think V2 is going to be around for a long, long time. And in part because it works, in part because it's so embedded in our psyche anyway, it's going to be hard to rip out. CDA, I'm less sure about. CDA. When you dig deep into CDA, you try to get coded structured data out of it, it's hard. It's actually really hard. So unless you've got a big investment in CDA, that's an area I think you'd look at fairly early on and you'd say, well, hold on, fire can do this. Yeah, should we really be going down the CDA? So I can see CDA being deprecated soonish, although it will continue to be supported by the SDO. So we're not going to sort of <coughs> close the door on any of these things. V3 is often more, is more in your messaging space. The areas that have a big V3 infrastructure are going to have the same issues as with V2. You know, it's going to be a big job to replace it. Do you really want to do it? So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see fire gradually increasing, these gradually diminishing, but it will be, it will be a gradual process. But it's, it's, it's a good question. Tony Thorn here. Are you seeing any take up from any of the major suppliers who've got personal health apps for using Fire to take data on? You mean like, as in mobile apps? Yeah. So for you know all the all the wearables, so your Androids and your, your yeah. I've been mean, a lot of work with the devices in particular. The devices community are uh, are coming on board big time with Fire, um, and we have uh, we have a series we have what we call connectathons. Uh, I have three of them a year, and we use those connectathons to test out those sorts of things. 
and more and more the devices manufacturers are starting to use that. Uh, Google turned up at the um, Dev Days just last week, so they're uh, starting to, uh, they're building on fire internally. They talked about how they're actually doing it. Um, some rumours about Apple haven't heard anything concrete as yet, but I'd be very surprised if we don't see something in the next year or so from them. David, yep. Uh, Manisho here. <coughs> in terms of the hype cycle of emerging technologies. You're not allowed to ask that question. <laughs> Where is fire, do you think? Let me, let me put it to you this way. At the dev days yesterday, Graham Greve, not yesterday, last week, Graham Greve, who kind of started this whole thing off, uh, was asked that question and he refused to answer. So I'm going to do the same. I th although I'm going to, I'll add a little bit more. I think in some, to some extent we've, we've, we've passed the peak, um, but there was that comment that was made before by, by the surgeon. Um, you know, there is still that fire's going to solve world hungerish thing that's happening out there and we're, we're actually now having to work to dampen it down. But we are getting a lot of real world implementations. Actually, in the UK, Black Pear did, I think, the very first fire, imp fire implementation on version 1. Lithuania have got a national system based on version 1. Public, you know, you know production systems. So, I don't think we've, <coughs> I think we're, we're, we're tilting over the top there. And if NHS Digital is going to start producing transfer of care spec specifications and GP Connect. <laughs> Everyone's gone quiet on that. So okay. that, that needs to be pushed out and used in the service. This is the just a, this is just a picture of the uh, of the front page of the of the spec. I um, I won't go into it, into it. The um, the that's the URL to it down through there. I really put this in place just to again emphasise the, the breadth that fire has, um, has, uh, has, has come across. So you'll see the, the foundational stuff, there's your, you know, how, the base documentation, there's your RESTful API, how to query a fire server, there are your, uh, your common resources occurring down through there, there's patient, practitioner, so forth, clinical resources, and there's your clinical reasoning. So more and more, as I say, we're starting to see fire resources and fire thinking being used in across the breadth of, of healthcare, <coughs> healthcare IT. Okay, resources. I've talked about resources a bit. It's in the name. What is it? So I guess we think of the resources being the, the, the content model. It's the thing that you exchange. <coughs> With a few exceptions, which I won't go into, it's the atomic unit. So when you're exchanging something, you are exchanging a resource not part of a resource. Your resource might have extensions with more bits that might not have all the things in there, but it's, it's a thing in and of itself. And it doesn't matter whether you're exchanging it in a document, a message, RESTful, it's exactly the same one. And that's, that's important. But that other point, that, that third one again is equally important. We didn't sit down and think, gee, it'd be neat to do something, oh, let's create RESTful resources, let's create and let's, let's do something. They are informed by work inside and outside of HL7. Fire is simply the next evolution, if you like, of a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge in sharing information both inside and outside of HL7. And again, I call out OpenEHR in particular about that because they've been in the business of thinking about, about healthcare for a long time. Uh, exactly how the two organisations work together is something which is being worked through, but there's willingness on both sides. But we've already seen it in the allergy and tolerance resource, for example, was a, a combination of both OpenEHR and HL7. And there are other organisations mentioned there that are involved. IHE uh, or Di DICOM is another one. We've got resources that have, the, the DICOM folk have worked with us to create the media resources and such like. IHE, we um, were actually talking yesterday at the, at the board meeting. Um, the XDS was the XDS exchange program. There was a document reference resource specifically designed uh, to support the needs as defined by um, by IHE, IHE XDS. Um, just the conversation that seems to be going around, I just wanted to chip, chip in. Interoperability doesn't necessarily mean interoperability. You've already said about the messaging and you know what you've described in the main is technical interoperability. My understanding of FIRE is also there's a certain amount of semantic interoperability in there. Where do you see the limits in terms of FIRE's capability? Or is it just something that is evolving and, and you're just going to see where it goes? It's evolving. I've got another section, I think it's this afternoon, where I talk about exactly how semantic operability, coded and structured data could work. Uh, so that might help to answer some of those questions. Um, again, and I made this comment earlier on, FIRE we see as being a platform spec. And what people do with that platform, we hope, is, is not limited by the platform. 
So it would be interesting. It would be interesting to see where it goes. But yeah, as I say, we, we certainly aim to work with um, with those other terminologies and such like. If that hope that makes sense. So I'll move on. Um, I want to draw a distinction here between a type and an instance. And this, Amir and I confused ourselves in the early days a lot over this one. Because we use the word resources quite freely. And we actually use it in two different contexts. The first context is the resource type. And that's like the definition of something. So when we look at the spec and we look at the definition of the patient resource, we're looking at a resource type. We're looking at a list of the things that could go into a resource and it's kind of like a template. Like here is the slot that you could put something into. An instance is where you actually take a resource and put real data into it. So to take my patient example, we put the patient's name and their date of birth and their address and their contact details and that becomes a specific instance of a resource. And it's kind of like you filled out a form, sort of. So, and oh, there's the example there of the patient. So, it's, I, I, I try to be explicit when I'm talking about an instance or a type, uh, but you do need to kind of have that in the back of your mind when we're talking about various parts of the spec. Most of the time, you are talking about the type. Most of the time, you are talking about the, the definition of what can go into a resource. But in some of the tooling, as we'll see shortly, we're actually creating instances of, of fire, fire resources. And here are some of the resources. So here are the, some of the clinical resources. We're anticipating somewhere between 130, 150 or so all up by the time we're done. Uh, we try very hard to make sure that individual resources don't overlap with other resources. Uh, and we try very hard to make sure that we have resources that cover the breadth of health. So these are some examples in the clinical space. And I, there's a couple of things I like to call out on this slide. The first is that each resource has got a name and it's very self-explanatory. So if you have a resource called procedure, you can be pretty sure with what it actually does. And equally, if you are looking for a resource to do something, if I want a resource to represent an observation, it becomes pretty obvious which one it is. And one of the design goals for FIRE was to make it easy for people to understand what it's all about. Because more and more what we're seeing, particularly in the app market, the mobile app market, is lots of developers are coming into our space who don't have a deep clinical background. And if you, for example, were to ask them to use V2 as their exchange mechanism or CDA, they would bounce. They would look at this thing and say, just exactly what have you guys been smoking? So the whole point about FIRE was to make it easy for someone who didn't know the health domain to understand what it's all about. And here is a real example of a resource instance. Would anybody who doesn't already know FIRE care to take a guess at what resource type this is? Religion. Very close. It's a patient. Um, and you can tell because it says patient. Um, and this slide really highlights the, the, the four main parts that you will see in any kind of resource. Now, this. Again, you don't really expect a clinician to be developing these things, but I think that a clinician can understand these things. So here are the four parts. At the top, we have the sort of metadata about it. That's the ID. Uh, think of that as being a database primary key for those who are in, um, in uh, computer science. That identifies this particular instance, because this is an instance here. Next, you have the text element. And the text element, we call this the lesson of CDA. One of the things that CDA did really well was they allowed you to get started in interoperability with the idea that if you can at least share enough information to tell a human what you're trying to do, you're one step on the way and then you can get it better as, as time went on. All fire resources can have a text element. We're not quite so dictatorial about what's in the text element compared to the structured data as CDA is, but what we do say is it should be clinically safe to render that to a user. There shouldn't be stuff in the, in the structured part of the resource which contradicts uh, what's in the text. And then I'm going to jump down here to the, to the structured data. These are the individual elements which are defined in the core specification. They are things like the patient identifier, like their name, like their gender and so forth. 
uh, religion is not in here. And interesting enough, the reason why religion is not in here is because in certain domains you actually cannot share the religion. For that, you would use an extension, and that's this guy right here. So, as I said earlier on, extensions are a normal part of fire. We're going to see a whole lot of Care Connect ones before the end of the day. Um, and every extension has got this URL. And this URL points to the definition of what the extension actually is. Hence my comment before about extensions <coughs> being like Z segments done right. Because the rule of fire is that if you have an extension, you must have an extension <coughs> definition. And it must have a unique URL. And the recipient must be able to retrieve that URL and uh, uh, retrieve the uh, definition from that URL and can then understand what the extension is trying to say. So you, whenever you receive a, a resource, if if it's got an extension, you always have a way of finding out what that extension actually means. And you can do anything with an extension that you can with any other data type. So you can create an extension. In this case, oddly enough, it is religion. I didn't realize it was lucky. Um, so in this case, and you can see it's a string data type, and the value is set to be Jedi. I could have said that was coded and bind it to a value set. I could have said it was a reference. So I can do anything with an extension that I can do with any other, uh, any other element. We looked at a, a few resources. I'm going to call out just a few that we're going to uh, look at today just to, just to describe them, but there are others. So the patient is obviously a key part of all of this, and I don't think I need to describe what a patient is. The practitioner resource and fire is any individual who is providing care. So that could actually be a ward clerk involved in providing care. It could be a ward clerk. It could be a, an authorised... Um, <coughs> Uh, lay person, I don't think of the right word for it. So practitioner does not imply a doctor or a nurse or anything like that, although that they are practitioners, it's much wider than that. And observation is probably one of the most widely used resources. That's something that you observe. It's a blood pressure, it's a, uh, it's a lab result, it's a, it's a height, it's a weight, it's something like that. A condition is a something like a problem, so asthma, diabetes, TB. There's a little bit of discussion around the uh, connection between what's an observation and what's a condition because the edges do get a little bit blurred. Uh, that's kind of being worked through at the moment. But if you, broadly, if you think about problem, when you think about condition, you won't be too far wrong. The list is a critical resource to understand because lists are explicit or can be explicit in fire. We're going to see that very soon. Medication statement is a uh, a statement about a medication at a point in time. It's saying, I take amoxyl, I take furosemide. It's not an order, that would be a medication request. It's not a, an administration, that would be a medication administration. So this is what you put in a patient's medication list to say what they are taking. Composition is part of being a, uh, a, a document. Again, we're going to see this as we go through. And I can't remember why I put substance in there. Oh yes, because we're talking about allergies, yes. So a substance is something that you might be allergic to, like latex or something like that. Now, one thing I will just very quickly is go into the spec uh, just to explain a couple of things. I hadn't intended to do this, but I will anyway. So there's the R3 spec there. Um, it's at fire.index.html. Now, if you want to go in, I, the way that I find, if you look, think about resources, the quickest way is to go to that resources tab at the top and you will then get an index of resources. I prefer the alphabetic myself because I'm familiar with where they are. So those are all the resources in FHIR. But you can also see them in terms of like a categorised layout as well. But if I want to go in something like the patient, uh, there it is down there. First off, notice that number. I talked about the concept of a maturity model. So although FHIR is always released as a single version of the spec, Individual resources within it are at a different level of maturity. The higher the number, the more mature it is. So patient is, is at level 5. It's, it's very close to going normative. What that means is that once something is normative, it cannot be changed in any way other than backwards compatible. So anything up to that point, we can take elements out, we can move them around, we can change the name, we can do whatever we like. Once we go normative, it's fixed. And to become normative, 
a resource has got to have been used, and there's a whole set of quality criteria around it. We, this comes out the CMM thing, you know, there's a whole, there's a, a formal specification for how something becomes mature, which you can look at if you want to. But what I really wanted to show you is if you go into the patient resource, you will see there the scope of usage. All resources talk about where they are intended to be used, and that might answer uh, our surgical question before. Um, and also in some of the resources... David, could you read that out? It's quite small. So for that one, could you just read out the scope of use for the patient? That's it will make it bigger. So if you go back to the top... So... That's it. Uh, there we go. So all resources have got a scope of usage. Some of them have actually got... They've, they've, we've called out where, uh, where there's a potential overlap. So part of the job of the FMG, which fire management group, which, which I'm on, is to look at the resources and to be quite sure that the resources are clearly defined. What we don't want, as far as possible, is for, is for there to be uncertainty as to which you would use when. So part of what, that, uh, uh, what we're doing there is that. And since I'm here, I'll just go down. There is the actual uh, definition of the core uh, parts of the resource. I'm going to talk about this a bit later on, so I'll skip past that. Terminology bindings, again, something I'm going to talk about in just a minute, but this is where coded elements are found. Um, one thing which is really cool, if I go to, say, um, let's choose something which isn't too big, that on their marital status codes, if I click on it, I'll get a list of what those codes actually are. So it's fully, fully hyperlinked. Um, I'll just go back. And then uh, bindings, and then there's various other... Uh, in the case of patient, there's a lot of information about linking patient and then merging records uh, and then search parameters down the bottom. So I, I urge you, if you're interested, go in and have a look at the spec. Another key, so, 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 so the resources are the fundamental building blocks, the atomic units of, of fire for sharing data. But in and of itself, a single resource is not that useful. When it really becomes useful is when you start to link them together to tell a clinical story. And that's a concept we call references. So here we have a procedure, and the procedure was done on a patient. So there is a reference from a procedure resource instance to a patient resource instance. And that procedure was done because of some condition and it was done by a practitioner <coughs> during an encounter and created a diagnostic report. So the reason why this is, this is so important is, again, because you're going to be doing this soon, so, so, so it, pays to, it pays to understand it. But it's, as I say, it's this creating this graph, this web of, uh, of links, is when you start to, get the, um, start to get the value out of fire. To give you an example, here's a... Uh, Here's a, a, a consultation, GP consultation. A uh, two-year-old boy with a pain in the right ear, elevated temperature, uh, took the temperature at 38, saw an inflamed right, right eardrum. There's your diagnosis and there's your prescription. And then two days later, they came back with a skin rash, uh, no breathing difficulties, evidence meningitis, and thought to be an allergy, and changed the antibiotics. And what we've done here is we've color-coded each, each element in here with its corresponding resource. So there, amoxyl is a medication. Actually, skin rash is an observation. The, the patient is a patient, and, and so forth. So that's how you would take a, you know, a, an actual clinical scenario and turn it into fire resources. And then, taking what I just said before, here is how we now hook them all up together. This now takes that clinical scenario that we had before and starts to create those linkages. Now, I haven't created all of the linkages here because that would make the graph a little bit, uh, a little bit too big. But if you look at the pain in the right ear for three days, so we've called that a condition, and we've said that the asserter of that, the person who said it was true, was the patient. And we've said that we talked about it at this encounter. And then, if you look at here, elevated temperature and temperature uh, 38 degrees, they're both observations, but in this one, the performer was the patient, because the patient came in and said that my temperature was high. And then I took it, the clinician, and I noticed it at 38 degrees. So 
what, we, what we're doing here is we're being absolutely explicit about the connections between resources. For those who are familiar with, um, with CDA, there's the concept of context conduction. Was, does anybody know what I mean when I say that? No? Nope? Jolly good. In that case, I won't talk about it anymore. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, so, so, so that's important. So, so we are explicit about all these connections. And when you look at a graph like this, hopefully what you can start to see is the value that you get with being able to pull out these individual items of structured coded information with very clear connections and store them somewhere where you can both use them for the delivery of healthcare but also for analysis, for decision support. Coming back to your comment very early on about PDFs and such like. Um, so this is where if you're, if you're exchanging information at this level of granularity, you can do stuff with it that you can't do in any other kind of way. And because it's standardized, um, you know, you can pick up these elements and move them somewhere else if you need to. Yeah. John. Hold on. So, microphone coming. How is this just not building a relational database? You could argue in some cases it is because these are relations. You could argue that each resource could actually be a equivalent of a table in a relational database. You're right. So you could think of it in that way. But a relational database is a very specific set of technology. So you could just as easily use a non-relational database. You could use a graph database. Uh, you could store them as, um, as specific. So the principle is absolutely right, but it's not tied to a particular technology. So, so will this approach allow you to analyze aggregated data? Yeah, and there are people doing that. So part of the whole big data, genomics, all that kind of stuff is um, using fire as the underlying. So that's what, that's what Google was showing last week. So having Google was absolutely stunning. So they showed an example of where they were collecting in resources. They're persisting it in what they call, um, dang, I've forgotten the word. They're, they're actually storing it in a slightly different way, but they are resources. And then they were doing queries over millions of records in, in near real time. It was absolutely stunning because they'd, they'd be able to break it up in that, in that context. So the principle is exactly right. It's just we're not tied to that particular technology. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to... Um, so that's, that's really all I was going to talk about, the background of fire. Like, there's a lot more stuff I could talk about, um, but hopefully that's enough to at least give you a, um, an overview of what, of what fire is. Uh, in terms of the reference graph you were showing in the last slide, um, isn't it dependent on the sending system to record those references to an extent? Because FHIR itself has not go any business intelligence to create those relationships. Absolutely. Absolute. So if most of the EPRs and GP system won't allow you to kind of have a relationship between a drug and a, a, and a, and a problem, FHIR can't kind of make them up. So it, it all depends on the sending system, how much relationships they have got to start with. Yep, that's a very valid, valid question. So if you like, what FHIR does is FHIR, FHIR describes how to do those relationships, assuming that you are able to do that. But to take your example, most PMS systems would know, one hopes, who the patient was. They would know what the drug was that was being prescribed. They might know what the condition was and so forth. So they actually have that data. It's up to them to decide how to actually package it up when they choose to send it. And it's up to organizations like Care Connect and others to start saying, well, here is how you should do it. Here is our profile for doing it. We're going to talk about profiles a bit towards the end of the, end of the day. And profiles, of course, as, as you know, are a, a statement of usage as to how we're going to use FHIR. But yes, at the end of the day, it's up to the capabilities of the sender and the recipient. So it may well be that a recipient actually can't pull all that stuff out. All they can do is to troll through the textual items and display that. And that's okay. You know, it's just better than nothing. The data's there for them to use when they have the capabilities to do it. Um, so the resources model is the link between the information model and the fire artifacts. So a number of the questions that came up this morning when we were looking at the information model were sort of along the lines of, well, I've already got this stuff, you know, what do I, you know, why are you showing me this? And really the reason is because that builds up to this model here. So now here is the point 
that we start getting down and dirty with real resources. So the purpose of the, res of the, uh, of the resources model is to take the information from the information model and represent it in fire resources. And we use a logical model of the same tool that we used before to actually build this, uh, to build this. And the thing here is that you actually need to understand fire to be able to do this. You need to be able to understand what the resources are and what they mean. For example, a colleague of mine in New Zealand, we were working on adverse drug reactions, and he created a patient, and under the patient, he had the patient's name, address, height, weight. Now, that seems entirely reasonable, isn't it? Height and weight is about a patient. I happen to know, as a fire guy, that actually the height and weight is an observation. So what he was wanting to say was that he wanted to have a patient resource, and then there was going to be an observation resource, which was their height, and another observation, which was their weight, and link it back to it. As a fire guy, I know that stuff, and other people that know fire know that stuff. Some clinicians know that stuff, but a lot don't. And so the purpose and the point of having those two models was to allow those two worlds to interact. And over time, those clinicians that want to will understand more about fire resources because they will see the model which they created converted into a model that talks about fire resources. And that really is fundamentally what I was trying to get at with those two models. And in the resources model, uh, need for, the other big thing about all of this, and I don't talk about it an awful lot, but it's important to, to, to bring up, is that out of the information model, you, when you created it, you might have specified a subset of information that goes into a resource, or a superset that goes into, into a resource. The example of religion, which came up before. So if we had to store religion, then religion is really, uh, actually well, you could argue about it, you could argue that it's an observation of what a patient's doing, but that's probably going a bit too far. It's almost certainly a property of the patient. At least we can be happy that it is. So that's an extension. So the fire person should have the role of saying, right, I need to represent religion, I need an extension for that, has anybody else in the world created an extension that I can use? Because if there is, I'll use it. If there isn't, I'll create it, and then I'll publish it back to the community. So that's where we start to get into the reuse, where we start to get into the idea of feeding back into the overall fire community. You don't have to do that. There was nothing, nothing whatsoever stopping every single jurisdiction creating their own extension for religion, and that's just fine. But it does mean that a recipient <coughs> needs to be able to know, understand, and pass all those different all those different religious extensions. It's better to have just one that everybody can reuse. Yeah. So for example, how, to give a concrete case, where would you put something like comorbidity, for example, as a, as a concept and to, to build it up? Well, a comorbidity would be a condition. Um, and so you would you have to ha you're doing it in the context probably of discharge summary. Um, no, in terms of a patient in my pathway, who's, you want to know what their comorbidity is, say, before or after the intervention. So you've <coughs> talked about pathway. There is a part or a care plan resource. The care plan resource, I think, has comorbidities as a property which would link to condition. So it depends a little bit on your context. The comorbidity itself is represented by a condition resource. Okay. Exactly how you do it depends on your context. So, so there's an element here about the heading. So you, you, you may have a, a headings element where you might want to structure things in different headings and use a condition resource. You, you, you would, in, in, in a document you yeah. would, yes, yeah. in a document. So, so yeah. you, you might then go, here's the main problem, and then these are the comorbidities. <coughs> the way you'd structure that is have headings, because you may want to structure it in that way, and there is a resource that allows you to create headings. It's the composition resource, yeah. that's correct, yeah. So then you might <laughs> use that composition resource to create those headings, but under the comorbidities, you'd have to use specifically the condition resource because a comorbidity is a problem or a condition. Just do, does we, that make sense? So you're building these Lego building blocks. Yeah. So over time, does this resource then, are you saying that basically it's crowdsourced in a sense and it, becomes, it can become mature? So when there's... Crowdsource is, not, is a nice way of putting it. I'm talking about the extensions rather than the resources themselves. So all I'm saying is that 
at the point at which you decide to create an extension against a resource, the idea is you go out and you see what other people have done, use theirs if they've got it, add to it if they haven't. So my questions about the naming of things and going back, relating to your resource of condition, I can understand why otitis media is a condition and I can understand why comorbidity is a condition but I don't understand why pain in the right ear is a condition, nor do I understand why itchy skin rash and breathing difficulties are, because I have a different classification in my head as a clinician, which is about yep. presenting complaints, and I'm getting more and more confused about this. There's because a... these seem very precise and important distinctions, which are getting confused in the resource condition. Yeah, the actual, the actual usage is something which is under debate at the moment. Um, I can't give you a good answer right here, right now. I'm happy to take it up with you offline. Um, a lot of the what we're expecting to get out of real-time usage are these kind of debates. If you do have a strong opinion on it, I would urge you to get involved in the community and put your point forwards. Uh, and you will find that there are people who are only too willing to have that debate. Because that's the overlap between particularly condition and observation. And some of those discussions can get quite um, excited about as to which one is which. And just as an observation, when we're, uh, one, one of my kind of roles is to go and try and help people use SNOMED in a, in a particular hospital who've not been coding anything. And this distinction between observation, symptom, sign, complaint is very, very confusing for most clinicians. Yeah. It, it, it causes huge trouble, an argument. It, it, it's an area where I think we need to come up with some defined guidance as to where you would use both. And I think getting clinical scenarios and then giving, getting examples of those clinical scenarios are a, are a good way to, to, to do that. And again, I say, and I mean this quite honestly, is if it's something that you feel strongly about, it would be great to have you put in your perspective and even I mean, the, you talked about crowdsource before over there. Uh, a lot of the stuff we do is fully open, so we create wikis and people can, can put their perspective forwards and create the usage guides. And it would be great to have that input into, into those usage guides because that's really the next step and we just haven't got there yet. We've been focusing on the infrastructure. We haven't got to the best way to use that infrastructure. Sorry, I don't like to hear my own voice too much, but I, I, surely part of this is that you, these elements haven't been def defined at the start, so people are creating as pr primary elements things that should be secondary within collections. So to take the example that came from over there about the presenting complaint, presenting complaint could be a base level element in your hierarchy, and within that you could have the presenting symptoms and the diagnostic and the examination findings, all these things that clinicians understand as being separate entities that you lump all together as condition, was it? I can't remember. Oh. Condition, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the condition has got a, um, if you go and let's go and take a look at that. So if we go, and because you'll see a lot, oh, there we go, that's where I want to. So if I go, go into the resource, and go to a condition, like so. So there is the scope of condition. So again, I, re I really don't want to dive too deep into these discussions here and now. Not that I don't want to have them, but I don't think this is the place no, to have them. I, I yeah, but nice. yeah, no, fair enough. But again, I, I do urge take it, have a read through the spec, read through the specification, particularly the scope. If you disagree with it. Then make a, join the community and make a comment about it, you know, because it, that's how, the, how, how it will improve. Hey, hey. Hey, so my name's Sam, I'm a junior doctor and a CCIO in North London. Um, I want to go back to the fact that we talked about our observation conditions. We still actually have a problem in the medical community that as doctors, we still can't agree what to put in presenting complaint in a history. I read a lot of medical clerkings, and I'll have in the presenting complaint, end STEMI, angina, chest pain. Well, you tell me what's the presenting complaint there? And so I, I do feel that it's very difficult when you are trying to code 
uh, and go specifically back to a medical clerking, well, how, how do you relate it to that? Or are you trying to do it from a holistic nature and go, right, we're just going to use observation and condition here? Does that, it's more making a point that it's, it is very complex. Um, so the resources model, we took about that. So to create a resources model, so I'm going to close, close that down, close other tabs. Okay, so you use, there's the um, logical model of there. So I'm creating a new, a new logical model. And I'm going to, sh why am I not seeing what I'm expecting to see? Oh, because I've logged out, sorry. I've logged in as inter open. Um, I'm just going to find my, um, So this is a this is a model I created. I'll show you this one, then I'll show you how I actually did it. So what I did is I went through a logical model and I broke it down into fire resources. So here, over here, you see I took demographics, and I said that a demographics is actually a reference to a patient. I'll show you how I did that in just a second. So we now have the patient name, and you can see it's now mapped to that uh, name resource. And then I went into allergies, and I said that allergies is actually a list resource. And it contains a number of allergy resources, which are, I'm sorry, allergies, which are allergy resources. And so now, what I can, so, so I, I'm, I'm specifically linking items in the model to specific resources. So if, for example, I went to demographics, and I wanted to add an element, I can type in the, I'm sorry, press the wrong button. Uh, if I want to add an element to demographics, uh, say I want to put their address in, I could type an address here, but because I've already said at the top that this was a patient, I could type an address here, and because it knows that it's an address, it's able to work it out what the name is and what the correct data type is. And so that's now the address details. And then I can do the same with uh, the problem list, for example. Suppose I wanted to record a problem list, uh, although you actually we're supposed to be getting, you, you guys are supposed to be doing this. Right. So, uh, uh, so uh, this is the bit where you start to know more about fire, the resource model, remember, yeah. not just the abstract logical models. This might be where your fire guy comes and helps you as well, but as you're knowing more about it, your logical model will start to map to a resource model. And as you've gone in, could you just show us how, so if you go in to one of the elements, for example, gender. Uh, gender, yep, yeah. and have a look at that. So we've said that it's mapped to administrative gender, Patient gender. Yeah, patient. And so, and you go in there. there, here at the bottom, as you've started to learn more about fire, you're going to actually say the specific element in the fire resource that it maps to. As you're building your models, you're trying to build it so you now map it to the fire resources. But that might be something <coughs> your fire guy initially does, but as you get more familiar, if you want to go down this route and become more aware of the technology, you may Oops. start to do that and develop those models. So what we're trying to show you is how you take an abstract logical model, a model of content, think about the kind of information you want to share, and then learn more about fire by learning how you map that to those fire elements. And that's the place that you could record it in the tooling. And then once you've done that, so you can then generate a mind map out of that. So what we're now starting to do is we're now starting to draw the links, those reference graphs that we looked at before, so we have a patient, and we have a patient who has a name, a gender, phone, and so on and so forth. We have an encounter there. We have the medications on admission, which is a list. And the list has got medication statement resources. In the medication statement, I want to record the data asserted, and so on and so forth. So, so this is now how we're starting to, to build up the real fire resources. And I can add new stuff in here. So uh, shall I add the problem list in, or do you want to make well, it? I Go doing problems. All right. But I think you might just so, want to mention the concept of a list resource. So the list resource is a, well, there's actually two, I'll, I'll come to that one in a second, um, but yes, I will. So um, I, I mentioned that there are actually two, um, two maps that we can use to go to this sort of stage. This is the first one. So this is the one, and I'm, I'm at the type. These are resource types. So I'm saying that my EDS resource has got a type which is a list, and that list and things has got actual allergy intolerances. 
I can also view this graphically, and I do that by using this thing called the Scenario Builder. The two work together. The idea of it is, and I'm going to create a new scenario, and I'll call the new scenario London, just to remind me of where it is. But here is where I can now start building up um, those links. So I'm going to click the graph resource there, because that's the fun one. So what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to start adding resources. So I'm going to add a resource, which is a patient. I can't see it on the bottom there, like so. And I'm going to call the patient John Doe. Um, oops, I'm going to add them to the list. Okay, and what I now see is there's my patient sitting there. I'm going, to, I'm going to think about problem lists. So the next thing I want to do is start adding some problems. So I'll create, uh, add a new resource. This time it's going to be a condition. And I'm going to say it's asthma. And I'm going to add it. And now you see what's happened is that I've added a condition to my scenario, to my model. Uh, I need to get the words better. And the tooling already knew that it had to have a reference to a patient. And so it's drawn that in. And if I can add another condition, which I'll call diabetes, like so. And so I now have two conditions and I have a patient. But I want a list. I want to be able to have a problem list for this patient. So to do that, I add another resource. This time it's a list resource. And I say it's going to be a problem list. This is one of the ways that Fire uses lists. OK. So now here we now see, so that we've got our list resource, we've got our patient resource, we've got our condition resource there and there. They are both linked to the patient. So remember I said that references in Fire are explicit. So you can't assume, if you're in a document, for example, that a, a condition is about the, the patient that's in there. It might be a different patient. You always have this link. But what I can do is I can go in here, I can go to the list resource, I can go to the entry on the list, and I can add asthma. And so now I'm saying that I have a list resource. The list resource is about a patient, and the list resource contains a condition called asthma. And I now want to add my diabetes there to it. So again, I select the list. I go back to my entry, to my item. Now, I need to add a new branch because um, I'm, I don't want to change the existing branch because I've got, I've got a link out of this list to condition. I want to create a new one, like so, which I will add to uh, diabetes. And so this is now a problem list in fire. It has got the, it has got the, um, the, the, the patient. And you see how the resources all reference back to that patient. And then there are resources from the list to the individual conditions. Resource references, I'm sorry, references from the list to the conditions. So the thinking is that what for folk that want to get more deeply into how fire represents clinical stuff, what this does is allows you to generate pictures of what the stuff actually looks like. I think that what you're going to find is that those two models work together. That the, um, the fire person, or the person with fire knowledge, develops the resources model, which is the hierarchy model, this guy here, and says, well, this is the overall layout of how you want to do it. And then the clinician goes away and says, oh, ho, but I need a real example to get the structure in my head. So they then go to the, um, to the resources graph, to that scenario builder graph, and build an example. Then they can say, okay, well, so I've got two conditions, and those two conditions link to a list, yada, yada, yada. Right, I get it. I get how this stuff is actually done. So automatically going between the two is going to be kind of hard, and I'm not entirely sure what value it brings. The, the one because they're aimed at slightly different different audiences. So, so there's an element of having to get stuck into it to get a feel for it. It's one of those things that, like, when you first get exposed... I mean, I've been working with David now for several months. <laughs> when you first get exposed to this, it feels quite heavy lifting, getting your head around it. 
but you have to just do a scenario, get into it, use the tooling, and it becomes a lot easier. And I've asked David as well, simply, can you create an automated output for me for this, that, and the other? And it's actually quite difficult to do that once you get into it.